today and to this evening's talk presentation by uh, Sheila O'Donnell and John Toomey, um, who together founded uh, O'Donnell and Toomey in 1988 in Dublin. Um, and they, I, I have personal experience of one of their buildings, so I feel I know them very well. Um, because I, I had the fortune of working in the Lewis Glucksman Gallery in Cork for some four years. And I can honestly say that I looked forward to the end of exhibitions when the walls were free and I could go and touch them and enjoy the beautiful curves and, and enjoy the materials of the building. Um, and O'Donnell and Toomey um, were awarded in 2015 um, a very prestigious prize that from the Royal Institute of British Architects, um, that being the Royal Gold Medal. And this is, this is one of the world's most prestigious lifetime achievement awards for architecture. Um, and they were among the youngest to receive that award. Um, and among very few Irish architects as well, others being Michael Scott um, and Peter Rice, who's known for his... Um, the Sydney Opera House and the Pompidou Centre. And um, so I'm very much looking forward to this evening's presentation. And I'd ask you now to welcome Sheila O'Donnell and John Toomey. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nora. It's great to be here. Um, this photograph is 100 years old, taken in 1919, and that's Le Corbusier with uh, the pot on his head. <laughs> and he's with his brother, Albert, and he's with his inspiring collaborator, Osenfant, who he met here in Paris when he came to work, and they collaborated to form a new art movement. Um, when Sheila and I were students, um, we were completely in love with the kind of legacy and lessons of Le Corbusier. And I'm sure that we were young when we memorized his five points for a new architecture, which I can still remember. Uh, the columnar plan, uh, the free plan, the free facade, the long window and the roof garden. And so we thought if he had five points for his architecture, we ought to try to try to assemble five points of our own, which we're going to discuss with you tonight. Um, this is page 31 of his first volume of his complete works, a project he designed in 1919, a hundred years ago this month, um, which was an inspiring project for us as students, a simplification of what he called the Maison Citron, the simplest house like a car. Um, I remember just being a student and being inspired by this image. And then when we left college, I came to Paris for a hot summer to try to work for someone who had worked for Le Corbusier. I met many of them and I worked for none of them. And I went to London and then Sheila came to London and we both worked for our second hero who was James Sterling. And James Sterling was, um, became like a kind of uncle, mentor, important person to us. And James Sterling studied architecture at the School of Architecture in Liverpool, which is the oldest established uh, RIBA school in Britain. And we learned to draw from Sterling, like Sterling. And then this year, we were lucky enough to win the competition to design the new School of Architecture in Liverpool. So it's an amazing kind of gift to get when you are older than your uncle was when you met him, um, to have responsibility for the culture of his school. So thinking about that, back to the five points. Um, we tried to articulate a kind of argument for how you might design the School of Architecture in Liverpool, how an architect ought to design any building. And the first is um, the feeling of place. Our particular site in Liverpool has, is near the cathedral in, in, the, in, the ta in the city of Liverpool and we're trying to pull the relationship with the cathedral into the university, but really we're trying to push the university out into the town and, if you like, civilize. So 
both in, in the both of both the university and the city. And so our first principle is the question of place. And I would say that in our architecture, we try and work from the ground up. From the ground up, meaning from the actual physical ground, that is how a building stands on its site, but also from its cultural ground, what its purpose is, what its ethos is, what the spirit that's embodied in the project. And then in our work, we try and work from the inside out. So that is, if you like, a question of space, not place. Um, how the volumes of the buildings that we're putting together contribute to the organism, to the health of the organism of the building. And I guess a third principle in our world might be um, the plan, the organization of the building, that the whole logic of how you work is comes out of the uh, intellectual and um, uh, corporal understanding of the sequence of spaces, the arrangement of spaces that makes up a, a good plan. And the fourth principle, which is a Greek term, a bit un unpleasant in the mouth of tectonics, it just means how the thing stands up, how the thing is structured within itself, and that there's a logic or even a beauty about how materials are assembled. And the fifth principle, which has to apply to everybody uh, working today, is the question of responsibility to the environment, that the building can take natural light, that the building can breathe the same air, um, that the building cannot add to the problem that is surrounding us in our, in, our, uh, in our deteriorated environment. So if you're thinking about the work we show you tonight, um, it might be useful to you to uh, try and think about how we stand against our own standards of those five principles. Um, and the, the luxury or the pleasure for us is we get to make a, a huge studio for hundreds of architecture students under the umbrella of the name of, um, of our mentor, James Sterling. So the first project I'm going to show is the one that uh, Nora just talked about. We've been 20 years working in, in University College Cork, and um, we will have, by the end of this month, completed three projects. So let's say three buildings and three projects in 20 years. But the significance is that this is the old quadrangle of the center of um, University College Cork. And around that quadrangle, we first made the Glucksman Gallery, and then we made a pedestrian bridge, and now we're finishing a student hub, which <coughs> between us we will now discuss. Um, the site, if you were up in the air, Cork is out this way. The first site for the Glucksman Gallery stood on the ground of what was formerly a tennis court in a beautiful parkland setting. And the idea was to protect all the trees and the whole setting. The second site is to cross the river and make a connection back to the city. And the third site is on the opposite side of the quadrangle. The characteristic of the lower ground, as it's known in UCC, is this beautiful feeling of the limestone cliff on which the college stands, the river flowing through its uh, riverine meadow lands below, and the relationship between the tree canopy and the cliff edge. And this photograph was like a thought diagram of how the building should feel. We thought that the building should have a canopy above the ground like the trees, that it should have columns like the trees, that it should float over the ground like the trees, and that it should its ground should be made out of the landscape itself. And um, I suppose you can gather even from my introduction that we like to approach projects uh, sort of sideways or uh, and to take our time. But in this case, we had to work fast because the president of the university had to go and collect some money to build this building. So without knowing exactly what we would do, we were brought in to see the building committee at UCC who asked us what the building would look like. And we had no idea what the building would look like. Seamus Heaney had just recently published his volume, Seeing Things, and there's a beautiful poem in there about the ship in the air that appears to the monks in Clonmacnoise. Noise. So not knowing anything else, I read the poem to the building committee, which apparently is the first time a building committee has sat through a whole poem. But it was a kind of promise. And the promise was that the building would have this relationship with the limestone of its ground and that you would 
pass through between the landscape and the celestial vessel um, in the space in between. And uh, I'm happy to say that um, Seamus Heaney himself did manage to walk through this project and was not too embarrassed, I hope. Um, so the building, you know, is, is a ship in the air. The building is tied to its stony landscape. But the most important aspect of the, that uh, borrowing we made from Heaney is the idea of the space in between that now extends the college campus. So maybe one of the things we'll also be emphasizing today is that when you make a building, when we make a building, we're also trying to push the, uh, push the public space and create something around the building that makes its setting more important than itself. You know, ideally, apart from rubbing the walls, um, ideally when you go to the Glucksman, you say to yourself, what a beautiful river, what beautiful trees, what a lovely view. You don't say to yourself, I'm looking at a building. You're, you feel like you're in a place. The Glucksman is designed to, so to speak, turn in the trees to catch the views back to St. Finbar's Cathedral or out towards the campus. It's designed to work in its timber architecture with the uh, architecture of the trees themselves that are nearly touching it. And then just below the Glucksman, in the shadow of itself, we made this new little timber bridge that crosses the river that allows the river to flood, which I'm afraid that river does from time to time, and therefore it can flood through those arches. Um, and it can cross the river at a slight kind of tilt, which most bridges don't do, but this was to thread together the, ro the roots of pedestrian movement. And also to say that maybe crossing a river doesn't have to be so direct. You know, you can go first to a point of rest, then across the river, then to another point of rest, and then eventually on your way. So even a bridge can be a place, um, as all the bridges in Paris are. Um, it's a timber bridge. They floated it up the river and then they craned it, um, they craned it into sight. So one of the things I can't show you but was nice to see was simply the arrival of these huge timber beams in the, through the river in the city of Cork. Oh, you have your own microphone. So I'm going to talk about our third project in University College Cork and you Across the lecture, we're going to exchange between the two of us quite a few times, so we'll just get used to that. Uh, from the bridge, if you look up to the old campus, you see the beautiful stone buildings, and on the right with the chimneys is the building that was originally uh, the medical school. And this is the site for our third project, which is a student hub, a place where students socialize, but also where students meet their advisors about careers, about psychological issues, about other thi mature student help. So it's a kind of, uh, well, it's called a hub. It's a place of meeting and a place of work. And our project is to take the old building, which is the very black walls, and then to make a new place, the market hall, which is built behind that, and also to make new routes through the site within the campus and into the building. So the, the old building, it was a, a building from the... Um, mid-19th century, very beautiful series of stone buildings, which is the kind of frontage. And then behind that, we're building what we call a kind of harbour wall. And then rising out of that, um, a lantern, which has some meeting rooms looking back over the campus. And the old building was built. Uh, I think uh, it's we really like working with old buildings. We find it very interesting and very inspiring to think about the kind of uh, the history and the memory and the character that old buildings hold and also the process of how they were made. And this old building was made in a series of, at different times, as a series almost of houses. And in fact, another one appeared after this with these chimneys and these stone walls. So in a way, our intervention is just the next move in this. Uh, so when we came there, the back of the building had a lot of um, ugly uh, extensions built. So our first move is to say we remove all of those um, poor buildings from the back. And then we start to think about how to use this building and how to use it as the starting point or the inspiration for the new work. So the first move we made was to, put a, to make a big hole in the building, uh, which was in a way um, quite a radical thing to do, to keep that chimney, make a big hole and then put a canopy out to symbolize the entrance to the new building, but also to the college beyond. And then the second move was to build this big sea wall and make what we call the market hall, a new space at the back, which uh, face which uh, adheres to the old building,
but is surrounded by and defined by a series <coughs> excuse me, of small rooms that are like advice rooms and meeting rooms and cafes. And then at the top, this lantern which looks back over the old building towards the campus. The building is, as John said, almost finished, not quite finished. And you can see here the, the canopy, which is almost done, and how the entrance goes past the chimney through there and how the, the lantern and the big window look out over the old building. So what happens when you enter as you're still outside? And I think a thing that really interests us is the kind of spaces that are part of the architecture but are not necessarily inside. So in this case, you walk under this building you come in through the door there, or else you walk right under and out to the rest of the campus. But this space, which is covered in external, is a very important part of the space that the students have in the building. And it's a place where students can kind of hang around and before and after going in, or can think about whether they really want to go in or have the nerve to go in. Because I think sometimes it's quite hard for people to enter buildings. Sometimes people are afraid or nervous of what will happen. So the idea of making a space that is a kind of inter, um, a contingent space is something that interests us. So when you come in, you come past the reception into this big hall, which cafes and different spaces open onto. And then there's the circulation in black of the new building. And then the in the old building, we've installed a set of new rooms and student offices, which uh, and then a student radio station student radio station opens into this open air space so there's as you walk past you can see the the people um, in the studio of the radio station and this is the side photograph of what it will feel like in that space with the bridges running across from upstairs and then on the upper next level that's where that bridge comes across so this is still a kind of social space where students can meet and have discussions and look over the big space and then when we had to put new rooms into the old building we were very there's a beautiful structure in this building so all the new walls are in a way built like small buildings within the old structure so that we keep the, the roof and the ceiling. So when you're in that old building, you still read this uh, beautiful structure and then the new, build the new rooms will have their own ceilings so they sit like little um, encampments uh, within the old building. And then as you come towards the top, there's this big room which looks back out over the university, which in the section you can see here, the big meeting room has this big window that looks out and then the other spaces are gathered around the market hall, which has roof lighting and um, spiral stairs. And we're work the, the old building has very beautiful stonework. The new lantern is um, aluminium framed. And then the windows in the market hall are made in similar stone to the old buildings. They're stone mullioned windows. And we're working very much with the kind of character and material quality of the old building. So that is not quite finished. But in the same city in Cork, we have uh, recently, well, three years ago, finished uh, a project for a girls' school. And Cork is, for us, an amazing city because it's got very steep hills and Dublin is very flat. So we love working in Cork. And this school is probably the steepest street in Ireland. So in this photograph, on the right, behind this kind of red wall, is a girls' school that's been there for since about 1850. And they were in a series of old buildings which were not adequate but kind of beautiful and had a lot of character but they needed to extend to add in facilities for sports and science and social space. Just go back one. Oh, yeah. Blue. The boys' school is behind the blue wall. <laughs> <laughs> and amazingly, just after we finished the girls' school, we got a telephone call from the boys' school who said, um, you've done that thing for the girls. Will you come over and do something like that for us? So now we're working on a project behind the blue wall for the boys. <laughs> so it's... <laughs> But the girls, I mean, they're in this amazing place because it's on this big hill in the city and you know, the school site starts here. It's about three stories above the nearest street and at the top, the school site ends here in an orchard. And then there were three historic buildings in that and huge 18 meters level drop. And we had to make a school that feels connected, that's fully accessible and that works as a single entity. But we wanted to keep this sense of it being a set of buildings with outdoor spaces and fresh air and gardens and courts. So the top photograph is of the finished project. Um, our new buildings are the, the grey ones with the, with the zinc roofs. And then in between you see what we're trying to do is make, I suppose, a kind of um, a little walled town, a piece of city in the middle of this incredible place. So looking from the south, you can see that the girls are up there on an outdoor ball court, which is on top of the sports hall, which opens into the science block. And then in the old buildings, we've added small timber elements for circulation. And... I think we're really trying to integrate the old and the new, the inside and the outside. It was 
one amazing thing about this site, these are three diagrams on the left. The top one shows the four historic buildings which we kept. The middle one shows a landscape. I mean, in a way, our project is about adding a landscape, which is out outdoors with lots of steps and courts and gardens and connections, which in a way ties together the old buildings and all the new buildings. And we made a, a kind of a challenge to ourselves at the beginning that you should be able to walk from the bottom to the top of the school without ever going inside, but you also should be able to walk from the bottom to the top inside the school without ever going outside. So there are places where the old building and the new building are very close together, and we have little bridges to make the indoor connection and then external staircases connecting courtyards. Um, and then at the very bottom of the site is the one really big space, which is a sports hall, which it seemed impossible, but somehow we managed to find a way of getting it into the site. But then because the other buildings are on top of it and the ball court is on top of it, it feels kind of integrated into the scale of the city. And beside it is a big outdoor flight of stairs, which is just the right size for a photograph of 500 girls in green school uniforms. But from the top, the old orchard garden at the top, you look out across the roofs of the science block with its um, cow across the ball court and back over the sense of the city. And I think for us that sense that we kept the relationship between a set of separate buildings with space between and with views to the city was very much on our minds. So the next project we want to show you is a community centre that we made in, in a Docklands area of Dublin. And it's a very special project because it was us working with community activists who had never before worked with an architect and they were never before organized in the group that we met them. So they were one running a sports organization, one running a childcare organization, one running a age care where they look after the elderly in the afternoons, and one running a drama group that is active in that area because Sean O'Casey, the famous Irish playwright, was born in East Wall. And so we had to find a way of making these people who all live in a kind of encircled part of the map um, of bringing them together into one place and giving them one um, identity which would make their common purpose, uh, make a kind of uh, engine, economic engine even, out of their common community purpose. So there, if you imagine there's 1,800 of these small two-story houses in this kind of railway track bound part of the city and the little bit popping up, well, the little bit popping up is the Catholic Church from the 19... 20s when the houses were built, and the second little bit popping up is the kind of bubbling energy of this community organization. Um, there's a street that has both the church and, a, and it used to have a school on it, and now it has a church and a community. It's like a third space for social life. So when they, we met them, because they were not people who had worked closely with architects, Sheila made these sketches just to depict the idea of how the building would relate to the scale and color and texture of the houses and how the kind of character of the building would be a match with the presence of the church because the only instruction we got from the community was it had to be as big as the church. <laughs> um, I must say this project, which is now 10 years old, this project is a happy story in our, in our lives because it went very fast. It went with absolute kind of um, mutual understanding and it has been an enormous social success. And the idea of the project is so simple that it makes you want every project to be so simple. All we did was propose some gardens. We said, why doesn't everybody collaborate on making four gardens? One for the childcare, one for the age care, one for the drama and one for the entrance to the sports and drama area. And then the community made themselves into a gardening club and they look after the gardens. And we said, imagine that it was as if, so you get four zones for the kids with the low windows that you can see them through, for the uh, sports, for the drama and for the aged care. But they all look into courtyard gardens. It's as if they're pressed on the ground and the forest is, is growing up through them. So you enter through a courtyard, you come into a brick floored hall that has all courtyards open to it. And, and you always in between the forest and the, and the halls. And amazingly, you know, I think we spent 5% of the budget on the gardens, but the gardens are all anybody ever talks about. Um, 
note to client, maybe. The, um, the rainwater comes down and is collected in the gardens. The children play in the gardens. The old people tend the gardens. The children get to meet the old people. And the whole uh, social kind of collaboration becomes one of great interest. And uh, those four people who started the agency are now still working there, but n they now have something like 50 people working in the building. And um, if ever you go to Dublin, call into the Sean O'Casey Community Centre. We designed it so totally focused on the gardens that we thought it would have no elevation, like no windows. It would just be, you know, like a monastery. But of course, rooms need windows. So we had to think of a way of making windows that were not windows. So we made a lot of round holes of different sizes that would allow people to see inside to outside and work the women and different people inside the community would have this connection with the outside. And then the courtyards are completely open one to one to another. And you move in between the courtyards on your way to bring your child to school or, or on your way to bring people home. And at exactly the same time we were doing that project um, in another socially similar area of Dublin uh, in called the Liberties, but physically quite different. It's kind of brick, traditional, working-class housing. We made a social housing project for uh, 50 new, new residents as apartments. But for us, really, it was a kind of, ur although it's quite small, it was an urban project about making a small piece of new neighbourhood, about repairing the damage that had been done by road engineering to this part of Dublin and just trying to bring back what we felt was the character of residential Dublin, which is a kind of brick-walled, street-based architecture. So the, the site was a little corner um, with quite a big new road running past it, which um, the new road is up there on the right. Uh, and then we just had to make a space here, and our intention was to make where the brown triangle is, to make a little enclave, a kind of pedestrian space where the, all the houses are would look onto and would have a kind of shared social space. And it's also a place that because of the geometry of the site, we could make it have this very narrow opening to the noisy street. So it's a kind of quiet place where children play and people socialize. And then otherwise, we're just trying to rebuild the street with um, houses and live work units and then rebuild the street around the corner. And we decided that we should build all the corners. So instead of um, having gaps at the corners, it is a kind of the building is very complex because it's so intricate, but it's really about also responding to the context and the character of the existing neighborhood. For example, with this beautiful brick, which is a uh, 19th century brick industrial tower, which is kind of framed by our buildings, which are made in red brick, which is typical of Dublin housing, but also typical of those uh, early industrial buildings in the city. And I mean, the point of this drawing is that just to show that it's a, it's a very intricate place. There are two-story houses with their own front doors around the court, around the timber yard, and then there are apartments and other uh, duplexes on top of those. So it's a kind of, um, it's a little um, casbah, a complex place of living with different kinds of residences and with big openings at the scale of the street. So there are two-story openings which give a kind of urban scale to the project where it looks out over the big street, and those are people's two-story lodges. And we're thinking about the tradition of building brick buildings in Dublin and the way that the Georgian houses are made and how, because a Georgian house always has a window in the middle of every room, you get these funny slips often where the door doesn't line up with the window and there's a kind of shift because the room upstairs doesn't line up over the hall. And so we got interested in that idea because it's quite difficult when making social housing now. It's very small apartments to make a, an expression in the brick architecture which has a kind of scale relating to the city. So we were thinking about that idea of the brick wall being like a stretched surface and in the windows which are small for bathrooms, medium for kitchens, big for living rooms, make a kind of pattern and a depth within that. And then that they make these social spaces and these, there are trees, and this was just after it's finished, but there are trees and plants and flowers, and every house has a threshold, every house has planting at the front door, and everybody either has a garden facing out into the yard, or if their garden uh, faces the back, like the person sitting up there, they have a little um, kind of winter garden projecting into the yard. So the sense that everybody has a, has a face or an opportunity to look into the yard was also very important in this thing to make somewhere that just feels like ordinary but special at the same time. So in the skyline of Dublin, this project has kind of settled in as part of the urban form. 
Um, we're working at the moment on a really big scale and kind of fascinating to us culture project in the east end of London on the site of the former Olympic Games. And we won this project as a master plan in collaboration with a London-based architect and a Barcelona-based architect. And between us then, we worked out how to uh, manage the overall master plan and the parts that make up that master plan. It's known as East Bank, which is a sort of culture education district. And in it, it I mean, this is the sports stadium that was at the center of the Olympics. This is the park that has been laid out since. This is the aquatics um, building that's remaining since the Olympics. And on the tongue of ground that's in between, we're making a number of culture buildings and some residential buildings and some park and some public space. And Sheila and I are involved, thanks Sheila, we're involved in two of those projects and we're gonna tell you about them now. First one that we're working on is the museum, a new museum for the Victorian Albert um, who regard themselves, um, I suppose I should hesitate to say this in Paris, they regard themselves as the best museum in the world. <laughs> but they're in London, you know. <laughs> and they are, however, an amazing institution to work with. And we didn't know how, how do you house the V&A? How do you make a new identity for the V&A? So the response that we would have, which is what we always have, is to just turn a little bit away and think about something else. And we were looking at the only Vermeer that we have in Ireland, <laughs> and which, you know, you can go and look at when you need water from the well. And as it, it just happened that Sheila said, imagine what it would be like to um, li live inside that woman's sleeve. You know, that would be a really interesting space. The kind of space in between the sleeve and the arm. So because I listened to what Sheila says, um, I started to try and draw the sleeve and just try to structure the sleeve. And uh, this happened to coincide with the moment that the V&A had a big show about the Spanish um, frock designer, Balenciaga. And what Balenciaga's costumes do is they drop to the floor um, like, 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 uh, like religious vestments. And, uh, and the marvelous thing about that is it creates a kind of costume, a kind of cover to the body within. And the V&A had a London-based photographer, a famous photographer called Nick Vesey, take X-ray pictures of Balenciaga's uh, structured garments. So we thought maybe we should be able to x-ray a building that the, all of the museum is inside, but it's covered by the protective covering. So what we have is a building that has a kind of a crust around it. It's wearing its own coat, so to speak. And in the, in the crust are all the parts that make up the movement within that crust. It's as if you can move between the jacket and the body. Because you know the museum looks after its own curation. Um, it installs its own exhibits. But the architect has to bring the people to each of the spaces for exhibition. So we're trying to inhabit um, the crust of what is otherwise, uh, in this case, a museum with no curves. Um, uh, because it has to be flexible. And then, I mean, I, I'm just really emphasizing that what our uh, position is in regard to this building is we have to create a, a recognizable identity for the project. Um, can be sort of memorable in a way, but that also provides infinite flexibility for the changing culture of the museum of the future. So we're imagining it wearing this dress and, and it's made in concrete, made in concrete as if concrete were stone. And then it's modeled in such a way that, that, that um, it's as if we're drawing lines or patterns um, across the surface of that structure and then opening it at ground floor. So the people, the people who are not in East London, who are not used to having such a world-class museum on their doorstep, can be just, can just go in without a single barrier or a single preventative sign. The building draws people from the public space into its own body. Um, for us, this has just been a very, this is building on site at the moment, so I can't show you it finished, but it has been a very exciting conversation with a, for a kind of a new kind of public institution. But it comes back to uh, tailoring, as so much of design does. There's a marvelous film, partly made in Paris, um, that uh, Wim Wenders made about the fashion designer Yoji Yamamoto called Notebooks on City and Clothes. And in it, you see Yoji 
down on his knees, snipping away at the dresses just before the models go out on the catwalk. And it, there's a conversation in this film which I wrote about in a book that I published um, about identity. And the film director talks to the fashion designer about when he first put on his first uh, Yoji jacket. And in the jacket, he felt himself. And then he realized he felt he's wearing the jacket itself, you know, like a knight in armor. So when we were trying to make our, our jacket for the museum, we wanted the jacket itself to be like something that you might find in the museum and that, and that the museum might stand among its neighbors of apartments and colleges. It might stand like uh, as if itself was on display. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, the second building that we're working on in the same site is a theatre for Sadler's Wells Dance Company in London. Uh, but as an introduction to that, because again, it's not built and it's at the foundations, it's a big hole in the ground. Uh, rather than talk in detail about that theatre, I'm just going to talk a bit about our attitude to making space for theatre and other cultural use activities. And going back to the thing that John mentioned earlier about the space in between and the importance of the space between and the movement. And this is a theater that we completed in Belfast in, in 2011, the Lyric Theater, on a, very, yeah, on a very particular site beside the river on the edge of the city. Um, and uh, Shea McKinney, who's seen here at the Foundation Stone, has very, was very much connected with this theater. But when we were, um, around the time we were working on this, I found this lovely book in a second-hand bookshop. It was an, um, Alexander Calder book about drawing animals. And in his page about how to draw a cat, he says that a cat asleep embodies a intense motion or intense movement. And I really like that idea that the cat is still, but the cat is somehow in its form, there is, you feel the movement. And the site for the Lyric Theatre, which was a competition, was, a, was triangular, which is awkward when you're trying to design a theatre and auditorium spaces. So we had the idea from the beginning, we're also, it's also quite a sloping site. So we were trying to think about how people would move and how you would encourage them to move between the fixed forms, which are in this case three spaces, the two auditoriums and rehearsal rooms. So we're always thinking about the spaces moving, the people moving between the static spaces. Uh, and in terms of thinking about the geometry and the difficulty of the site, um, Darcy Thompson wrote a wonderful book uh, on, on growth and form, in which he talks about the difference between two species of fit, fish actually being just almost like a, geomet a geometric process applied to them, that these are two different fish, but in a way their similarities, they're just changed by the way in which they um, are shifted by the geometry and by their environment. So in our case, the environment of the theatre was that we were working on this triangular site. And this is a very early, this was in the first stage of the competition, our first idea about how we would work with this triangle and how we would keep this sense of movement. And in a way, that remained as, in a sense, the main idea of the building. Because also to get the acoustic separation between the three uh, performance spaces, we built each of them as like a full brick building. So the brick walls are outside, but they're also inside. So when you go into the building, you're moving between the main auditorium the rehearsal room and the studio um, theatre, which is on the other side, and then the spaces between with all the glass or where the audience move. So there's always this wonderful contrast in the theatre between the, the dark space where the light is controlled by the lighting designers and then the space between where you can have daylight. And we try to emphasise that sense of connection and the connection with the river, which, uh, which was a part of the site which people had sort of forgotten was there, that as you move through the the foyer up towards the auditorium, you're looking at the river. And then in this case, this theatre was very specifically a fixed rake. What they were looking for, they do lyric plays, traditional theatre, and they wanted a fixed space in which then the stage could be flexible. So it's a kind of, it's almost like a wooden instrument, a wooden acoustic instrument inside a, um, a concrete enclosure. And then the circulation and the f uh, social spaces are much more loose and uh, flexible. And maybe the biggest thing is that because of the slope on the site that when you come in, there's a big staircase which leads you up towards the auditorium, and, but, but that's on the street, so you have a sense of connection with the daylight of the street. There's a lot of daylight in the spaces between the fixed rooms, and so this woman is sitting looking up the big stairs. And a few years ago, where there was a very um, significant moment in Irish history where 
the previous uh, members of the IRA, Martin McGuinness, um, shook hands with the Queen of England when she visited Belfast. And they were trying to find a place that felt kind of neutral but social, a place that felt public but controlled. So this handshake took place at the bottom of the staircase in the, in the Lyric Theatre. The theatre we're working on now in London is specifically for dance and it's, it's an academy as well as a theatre. So it has six dance studios and a big rehearsal space and then a, a very big flexible auditorium which is a rectangular space with retractable seating. So it's very different from the other, that last theatre, it's a much more flexible. But in a sense we were trying to make a building that expressed this sense of being an academy but also being a place where local children in the East End of London would come in and learn hip hop and dance. So the building has a very open uh, demeanor on the lower levels and then the studios which are above the foyer have these sawtooth roofs which express their use in a way and also the previous industrial use of this place. So we were trying to think about a kind of language to do with it being a dance theater but also to do with the client's wish for it to feel very robust and ready for work, not, um, not like a sort of fancy building, something that feels everyday. So we were looking at these choreographic diagrams about rhythm and movement and that's when we thought that maybe the studios could wrap around both sides of these pitch crews, both sides of the fly tower and the auditorium which is at the heart of the building which is the dark space. So we're trying to get a kind of rhythm into the way the studios work. And then on the public level at the foyer wraps around two sides of the auditorium and has a lot of kind of nooks and crannies and, in and uh, ins and outs and a place in the corner for community dance performance. So it's a kind of space that's multifunctional, that's open, that's welcoming, that should people should feel they can come in there any time of the day and not have to go to the theatre or buy a drink. Because this area, I mean, John said this about the V&A, this part of London hasn't had um, cultural buildings and it's very important that the local population feel they own these buildings. So the front of the building, instead of saying the name of the client, instead of saying Sazler as Wells, the sign is going to say you are welcome. And the idea is that at this level, the bar and the foyer are open out under a cover and then you see the dance studios above getting more closed as you move up. But that it has a kind of uh, social dynamic about how the, the um, foyer works. And I suppose in the early sketch, the idea that the foyer space would widen and narrow to give this sense of uh, social and other kinds of activity is very important to us in the sense that, that the building would have, that this space in between, the space between the function of dance and learning would be um, dynamic but also comfortable and flexible. And maybe just the very first building we did when we formed our practice was the Irish Film Centre, which uh, in 1992, which is in an o a series of old buildings in which we in a way carved out some public spaces, this is the historic map, and made a route through. And the new space we made was between a lot of existing buildings and which had very interesting geometry. And I think that the sense of making a place with a, which feels like a cross between an indoors and outdoors and which has the character of old buildings has in some way influenced all the work that we've done since then. Including this project, which we felt we had to show for a reason that will be revealed in a moment. But um, this was a project that I guess was worked out from the inside out. It's a culture center, um, like so many of our works. It's in Derry. It's made for the promulgation of Irish language and cultures around Irish language. I don't know what those Irish dancers are doing uh, hanging from the ceiling. But it was a wonderful opening. And we started with the idea that since the site was so long and narrow and had so little street frontage, we would forget about the street frontage and we would work the building out from its central space. In this sense, it's related to the film center that Sheila just showed, that you can start from the middle of something. You don't have to start at the front. <laughs> and um, what we were trying to do was hollow out a space, find a space in the middle of the block that could have multi-level interactivity. And that's what allows you know, an event like that to happen. Um, it's an, it has, of course, a concert space, but in a way, the social space becomes all the spaces. And the long pattern of the building was designed as if it was some kind of um, uh, roulette, not roulette, what do you call it? Pin pinball machine, you know, that you play when you're a kid in a cafe, and that the people come in, they buy their ticket, they go to the bar, they go to the toilet, they go to the theater and they keep bouncing off things until they find their way to the venue at the back. And, and that kind of analogy, 
uh, was all built around this central space. At the moment that we were at this site under construction, we were asked to make an exhibition at the Venice Biennale of a current piece of work. We chose this piece of work. And then we found they want a film of the work. And we said, well, it's not finished yet. How can you make a film of something that isn't finished? At the time, we had a young French architect, very blonde, very handsome, working in our office. That's him trapped inside this model. He's an older man now sitting in the audience, <laughs> Jerome Glerou. And we said to Jerome, why don't we make a model of this as if it was a movie? You know, um, We'll make a kind of installation which people can look into. The thing will play music at them. The light will change. People will feel they've looked into a box of tricks. And they'll have kind of got the feeling in the Biennale that, that their head is inside. Um, now, Jerome was not inside the model when it was finished. We, we found a way of getting him out. But inside the model, uh, the light changed across a three-minute cycle. The music changed. Sunlight was being replicated. It kind of got into your head. It even got into the heads of the architects, I think. So when the building got finished, then we're looking for the light to play in the way that it did in the model in Venice. And uh, in a way, the building becomes a model of itself. But what's wonderful about this is that we're trying to get the people to feel free to move up through the building so that they can walk across bridges, they can climb through stairs. They don't feel confined to stay on the ground floor. And in that sense, this building was a kind of breakthrough for a vertically organized cultural building. And it, it's thriving in its life in, Bel in Derry at the moment. This is another very vertically organized building. It's um, a student center in London for the LSE on an amazing site, again, triangular. We, it was a period when everything we designed had to be on a triangular site. But in a way, this building, it's, it's a building for student activity, social and um, support and prayer and gyms and dance studios and a pub and a music venue. So it's a kind of, the, it's the central world of the students, but it's in a campus which isn't really a campus. It's a piece of city with public streets and lanes and avenues running between it. So we felt that the building had to, in a way, be like a little piece of city itself and also that it had to be like a kind of beacon, like a lantern that shines at night and that students from all the different lanes of the university can see the building. And we also wanted it to feel singular so that no one activity would dominate, but that it was like a one big brick mountain. Uh, and the form of the building, which is quite complex, is a response to very particular rules about rights to light and setbacks to do with neighboring people. So we developed the form at the time of the competition to respond to all these things, but also because we knew we wanted to build in brick, we wanted to make something that had a singular form rather than a stepping, agitated form. And within the, the site, and you can see the shape of the site here is, is the triangle, we, act, we because there are all these lanes which are part of the campus, we int although the, the site was very small, we introduced a cut out here, which is an external covered space, to give the students one social space on the campus, because there were none before, and that has a glass roof over it, so it's a place of gathering between the inside and the outside, and then the building kind of crinkles around that, and there are places where you can look into different activities. And at the we decided at the time of the competition we wanted it to be very brick. This part of London has a really strong brick character. But some places needed open windows, some places needed complete closure, and then there were a lot of places like the prayer room and the dance studios that needed light, but a kind of privacy. So we made this idea of perforated bricks pulled apart that make a sort of screen that covers over some of the windows. So we developed a kind of language of solid and void bricks and then big timber windows between, which when we came to build the building was um, quite complex and took us maybe five years to do. And we made a decision that all of them, that there are no cut bricks. Every brick is uh, a special when it goes around a corner. And Laura, one of our architects, drew all of the 100 and something special bricks. And because, you see, a brick is made in a timber mold. So you can make any shape brick because you can make the mold any shape because a brick is made of clay. And at the time we were working on the detailed drawings, again, we were invited to Venice to the Biennale. And we made an installation which is in a way about this building, but it's also maybe about thinking about the relationship between uh, timber and brick and the moulds for bricks and a brick structure. And it brought us back to a place in Venice which we had visited many years before, which is this beautiful moment between the Grand Canal and a small canal where two buildings make this triangular space. But because of the way they slide past them, it almost feels 
as it's a kind of movement in the space. And we were trying in our first sketches on this site to think about how to make, uh, to use the triangular site, but to make this sense of movement and dynamism between the different parts of the, of the building. And so the building at the ground floor has a pub and a cafe and below ground a big venue for music. And then it's arranged around a huge staircase which circles around the lift. And the stairs is like a kind of public street, like a lane. It's like bringing the lanes outside into the building because Everybody wanted to be on the ground floor, and most people couldn't be. So we had this idea that it's all public, that the stairs is big, the stairs is a street. We bring daylight in through cuts in the back of the building. And always the lift shaft, which has this very colorful um, graphic which we designed, is a kind of, um, it's like a mooring device that tells you where you are as the stairs moves around and leads to different activities. And the stairs changes as it goes up because the building is getting narrower. But on the ground floor, when you open out into this covered space, which is part of the social life of the university, you're also able uh, to look down in this drawing. This is the street level, and this person is looking down into the music venue. There's a big window that comes up. The stage is here, and all the students are dancing and partying, and there's more daylight at the back. And as you go up, the ceiling heights are all different because there are different kinds of activities like cafes and studios and offices. Um, but the idea that the world of the building extends beyond its doors and beyond its windows to make a place outside where we design the street furniture and design the paving is probably a really important part of this building in a way feeling bigger than it is and being more part of the campus. And we designed it at the competition really in perspective because you never see that building as an entity. You see little glimpses of it down the streets and that's in a way how we thought of it at the start. Um, one of the last projects we want to show you is the recently completed building in Budapest for the Central European University. Um, maybe you'll press ahead there, Sheila, which is also really designed around movement. When we went to Budapest, we, I mean, uh, coming from Ireland, Budapest, it's so astonishing to find yourself on the river Danube. And our clients, the university clients, had a conglomeration of not joined together buildings in the very center of the historic core of the city. And we were so interested that there were points of view to the river, points of view to the cathedral in the town, and all sorts of connections possible um, across the town. So when a project is completed, you can see through to the new university from across the river. And when the that means in a way that the life of the city can be drawn through the fabric of the, of the university itself. It's like the university has opened its doors to bring the civic life inside. Um, this was a huge uh, effort because this is a World Heritage Site and it has no new structures built for, well, not since the 1920s. And every plot in Budapest has its own courtyard and every corner is controlled. So to make a new building in this setting takes a lot, a lot of conversation with monument authorities, museum authorities, planning authorities, city councils. Next, and we don't speak any Hungarian. So we had to knock a building down in the street, and then we had to think, what is the characteristic of the streetscape that makes it so special? You know, the prominent balconies, the overhanging cornices, the marvelous physicality of the street architecture. And then we found that the planning controls in Budapest have changed, and you're not allowed to project anymore. You can't have balconies and cornices. In fact, you must stay within the skin. So what we said to the university is, well, that's not a problem. If we can't stick out, we could withdraw. So we could manipulate inwards and give some space back to the street. So we were trying to quarry it out. And then when we went to the quarry, the local quarry, we found the local quarry, quarry itself is pretty good architecture. And uh, what I know, we pick the stone we like, and then we bring the stone to the site. And the thickness and quality of the stone, when relates to the stone myths of the buildings across the street. In some way, if you build in the local material, your building becomes almost invisible. It belongs where it stands and not so awkward where it stands. And what we're hoping is that when, and as the building weathers the new to the old, um, that they will work together in harmony in some way. I think some architects sometimes get confused about making differences so explicit between what pre-exists and what is proposed, as if time stops still. But as you know, the thing that is new today is old tomorrow. 
So the more important thing is the conversation between objects, between t across time. And we're trying to make our building work in that setting. We also had intended to build a, a, another building also in stone on, the, on another street block, another story. Um, but the point about this is really to say that when we were working with this material and working with these craftsmen, we could make something that is as new as new, but as old as the ancients. And the idea from the inside out was that every building in Budapest has its courtyard. Look at, there are buildings in Budapest that have seven courtyards. And we thought then that if we simply connected the existing courtyards together, that we wouldn't have to do very much. We could restore and repair and make interventions without too much change. Now, some of this change is kind of radical, but, but the idea is simple, that you can make connections. So if you see a drawing up here in the sketch, you'll see that we're trying to connect through the air, through the ground, to the sky, um, in the way that, and uh, maybe I should just describe what's so fantastic, no, in the next one, because this slide was taken, this, some of you may know this, this Matta Clark installation, which happened on the site of the Pompidou Center when it was under construction. And all these houses were going to get knocked down. So Gordon Matta Clark, uh, phenomenally, was given um, authorization to make what he calls the conical intersect, which is to quarry conical holes right through the existing fabric of the street in order to expose the interior to with it as if to make volumes relating the history to the outside just before those houses were demolished. But we're interested in not demolishing the houses. We're interested in the relationship between what is the quarrying and what is maintained. And so in our project, we quarried right through the historic structures in order to make the old feel new again and in order to find new connections between old passageways. And this has an interesting effect. So if you imagine all these houses and you couldn't get from one to another to another to another, but they're all part of the same university, we just introduce them to each other uh, as if we were Matta Clark at the moment of the Pompidou. And then we use that introduction to transform the, the more the, um, abandoned courtyards of the existing building, to transform them into kind of breathing apparatuses. Because in... Budapest, it goes from plus 40 in the summer to minus 20 in the winter. So we're using the courtyards like as ventilation machines um, that you'll see. So, you know, we're trying to keep the professors quiet in their rooms, let the students have the noisy space, let the air move through the building, and all of it goes to a roof garden at the top, which gets built from, you know, an early study to the final completion that there's movement through the volume of the, of the history of the of the structure. And then as you move, you know, you might be coming from a lecture. On the third floor, you cross an open bridge, you pass through the roof light, you find your way through here, and eventually you work your way up until you get to the roof garden from which you can see clear across the skyline of Budapest and to the proximate relationship with the Hungarian parliament. Um, if you're on the ground, this is the space we yielded to the street you can work your way in between the old and the new. There's an auditorium which holds four to 500 people. It has windows to the street. It's in a basement. So as you're passing along, you can see the activities down in the auditorium through soundproof glass. There's elaborate shutters that close this off. It becomes a kind of a sounding device for all of the activities. That's the view down into the auditorium. This is the way between the old and the new. And then as you go in, you pass between the old brickwork, some of which is new, but it's invisible mending. On the, on the wall between the two, the new stairs that in Budapest you must have spiral stairs. Everybody has one. We made it in concrete. And if you start going up that spiral stairs, you're, you're in the crack between the old and the new. And all that becomes a new public space. It used to be that the university door was locked. You needed a pass to enter the university. And we pulled that all the way back so that the public can use the university until you have to enter the library or have to enter a lecture. Um, the library is looking into these interior courtyards. We could keep going, Sheila. And the library is arranged around. Now, you see the old building has a courtyard, but our new building has three courtyards. It's like raining courtyards. But um, 
the library is organized around its courts, so it gets light from its courts and it looks to the river. And, and people are moving through, it's a 400 or 500 seat um, graduate library space for um, PhD um, students from all around the world. Um, what's beautiful is the feeling of the quiet or silence within the library and yet the openness within the library. And then of these people who choose their seats can see right out to the river and you know, study facing the Danube. Maybe they've come from America or maybe they've come from Africa, but they're in a new European city. We, we were, you know, you can imagine this work that it took through the conservation context of this city to bring a breath of air into it. And the proximity to the Hungarian parliament didn't seem to be so threatening at the time, but life moved on and Orban moved in and our unfortunate center of liberal thought in Budapest is now effectively uh, abolished by the politics of our time. So the university has moved to Vienna um, and nobody knows what's going to happen to the buildings in Budapest, which is very sad. Um, the last project is very small and very local, well, local to us in the west of Ireland in Connemara in Roundstone. And it's a, it's for us, I suppose, it's a really important personal project because it's working to make a research centre for an amazing man, a very Irish English man called Tim Robinson, who lives in this village, and whose um, whose house looks out at this view, and he's lived there for about forty years, drawing maps of the west of Ireland, writing amazingly beautiful books about landscape and about the geography, geology, philosophy, psychology of landscape. And in a way, he has taught Irish people to look at their own landscape in a different way. And this village Roundstone is very beautiful, and it's a place that has always attracted artists, and people make images of this wonderful harbour where Tim's house is looking out over the sea. Um, so his house is the last building on the end of the harbour, and his, up, um, his main house is up a level, and his garden is up a level from the level of this pier. And so he has gifted that house to the University in Galway to make um, a research centre. And this is the amazing Tim and his wife, Moraid, waving to us like a couple of cormorants on the bal balcony of his house just before. In fact, he's moved to London now because he's ill and he needs medical care. But just before they moved, when they were entreating us to try and make sure this project happened. So our project is to keep his house, which is here, and to restore and repair it, and then to make new entrance away and then a place of meeting and gathering and exhibition and some studios for artists and writers, a place where people can meet and remember him and his legacy. And maybe the thing that people most enjoy, these beautiful maps he's drawn, and as an Englishman, he learned Irish so that he could go around and particularly record place names which had been lost and which had been changed by the English army who made the earlier 19th century maps. So he's just an incredible focus on walking the whole landscape, talking to people. So it's a kind of, it's a history as well as a geography of a place that's recorded on this map. So when we started working on this project, we, we brought a group of students down and we asked them to make a map of the house that Tim and Moraid live in as a starting point for us. So they made their map of the house showing all the books in the study at the top and the chair the two people sit on and every bottle and the bedspread on the bed. So every single thing that was in their house is drawn on this drawing, which seemed to us to be an important way to start to think about how to move forward with the future of it. And this is um, a painting by Mick O'Dea, an Irish artist, of Tim, a very good portrait of his piercing eyes sitting in this amazing, decrepit but beautiful room looking out over the Irish landscape and the, the Atlantic Ocean from these beautiful windows um, to the mountains and the sea. And we worked, I mean, for as I say, it's a personal project, so John and I spent time on the site because we were with the students there. So we worked in situ making sketches of the place and I was just looking at the views in different directions from the house to think about how the new project or the extension of it would work with those views, with the existing house and with a kind of interesting garden that he had made over the years as he was um, writing his books. And then, as well as having worked for a while in Connemara, we went on our holidays to Greek island, as we often do. And we find a big relationship between the culture and actually the landscape and the, the, the sort of geology of parts of Greece and the west of Ireland. And 
in preparation, we were still thinking about this project, and I made these two paintings of on, on the same island, two different kinds of volcanic rock and obsidian and a very light tufa, both volcanic. <coughs> and the way that nature kind of shears one of them and sculpts the other one through weather. And we were thinking about how that might influence the way we would make this building on the coast. And then because it was just us and we don't really know how to make models anymore, everyone in the office does that, we, we started to make models in, in, in our holiday house of using pencils to represent the artist studios and the obsidi obsidian becomes the big room and the pencil sharpener is the lift. So we're trying to think three-dimensionally with the tools we had with us. We often find that working when we're not in the office is a really good time to get thinking about space and ideas. So then we, the project is drawn, which is to make a new public space, a new kind of external theatre forum on the, to lead you up to the level of the house and then walking along the sea to make this big room for meetings and collection and then the studios for the artists were serving his garden with these big roof lights, these big pitched roofs over the meeting room and over the studios with the mountain and the village behind. And then we're thinking of using a kind of concrete with a lot of local sea stones and seashells that give it a like it grows out of the cliff on which it's built. And this is this set of spaces which works its way around the, a geometric garden that, that Tim has made over the years and gives you this experience of sitting along um, right at the edge of the sea. And while again, Venice, I mean, Venice seems to weave in and out of our lives. At the time we were working on this project, again, last year, the 2018 Biennale, we were invited to contribute to uh, this, uh, free space was the theme of this Biennale, and we were asked to make an installation in a particular place in the Corderia, the beautiful old um, rope factory. And we wanted to make something that talked about work we were doing, so we brought two projects, the one I've just showed you of the little house in the west, and a very big project for an opera house in Shanghai, which had a similar form. And we sort of brought them together and combined them to make a pavilion or a structure within this corderia. And I think when, when you're invited to make an exhibition about architecture, I suppose our feeling is that we always want to make something that is a piece of architecture or is a space and a place and a form. And we were responding to the very particularly beautiful brick columns and to this window, which is beautiful and let we facing south brings light in, but you can't see out. So our project is really about building a flight of stairs that lets you see out the window. And it's walled in by the sections of these two projects in the east in Shanghai and in the west in Connemara. So we worked through uh, a series of little sketches. And in a way, while it is all of those things, it's also really um, a kind of rumination or a study about the idea of the way that Greek, simple Greek vernacular chapels sit in the landscape as whitewashed objects, which sit on the ground with um, benches and steps and mediate between the form of a building and the, the place of a landscape. So uh, I suppose we were making a little Greek chapel as well as making a description of the Shanghai Opera on the left and the round stone on the right. But it's a place where you can walk through and look into the section. There are lots of holes that bring shafts of light and gold leaf, which, which makes the light warm that comes from that window into the different parts of the project. It's actually so you can see the light coming down onto the book there. Or if you're a child, you can run through the space inside and, and back out again. Because we made a little kind of chapel, a little shrine at the back where we exhibited the drawings of the two projects and some talismans or mementos to do with the place, like the stone from the beach in Connemara, which is reflected on this gold leaf ceiling. So we're trying to make a place that has a sense of interior and a sense of exterior, but also of landscape, of steps, of seats, um, of places to stop. And I would say that for us, sometimes we think that, you know, if we just had a project to design a doorstep with a seat and a threshold for a door, that, that maybe we'd just be happy. That's maybe all, I mean, you know, the whole of our career ends up being back about how do you make a step and a seat? How do you make a threshold? How do you make a place that people are comfortable between the inside and the outside? <laughs> 